Well, welcome everybody uh, to this, our seventh in the series of online talks that we've been giving during uh, this very strange period. Today is a very important anniversary because on the 28th of May, 1945, exactly 75 years ago, Bright's Head Revisited was published. It's a novel that's never been out of print and has endured as a compelling story that is, amongst other things, about a love affair with a building. And what I want to talk about today is the relationship between Castle Howard and Brideshead. By Castle Howard, I mean, of course, Sir John Vanbrugh's Baroque masterpiece, begun for Charles Howard, 3rd Earl of Carlisle in 1699, and still home today to the Howard family. And by Brideshead, I mean both the story Brideshead revisited and the building that sits at the heart of that narrative, the home of the Flight family. This is a relationship that moves between the worlds of fact and fiction, and at times seems to sit somewhere in between those two realms. Let's begin with the novel itself. By 1944, the idea for a story focused upon a family in a grand house had been in Evelyn Waugh's mind for some time, with the working title, The House of Faith. Up to that point, Waugh's wartime career had been rather distinguished, albeit punctuated by periods of inaction and boredom. In 1940, he'd been commissioned in the Royal Marines and promoted to captain. He saw action in West Africa, was present at the fall of Crete, and in July 1944, was dispatched to Yugoslavia with his old friend Randolph Churchill, son of the Prime Minister. He narrowly avoided being killed when his airplane crashed and he suffered burns, and he was nearly captured by the Germans who launched a surprise raid on Marshal Tito's headquarters. But he emerged from the Second World War largely unscathed, and Brideshead Revisited was published just three weeks after VE Day. Well, what is most extraordinary about this record is that the writing of the novel occurred during the war years, between war seeing action in Crete and his journeying to the Balkans. And given the hazards he faced on that later mission, Brideshead Revisited might well have been published posthumously. But at the beginning of 1944, war sought permission from the army for a period of leave specifically to write his novel. And surprisingly, perhaps, given that the Allies in 1944 were preparing for the long-awaited Second Front in Europe, permission was granted. And in this, war had largely to thank Brendan Bracken, an Irish-born Conservative member of Churchill's cabinet, who was Minister of Information. And war was to show his gratitude for this support in a rather ungracious fashion. He retired to his usual retreat in the West Country, the Eastern Court Hotel in Chagford, Devon, where he wrote Brideshead in an astonishingly short space of time, beginning in February 1944 and completing the manuscript in June, at the same time as the Normandy landings by the Allies, a military action that is itself anticipated in the wartime chapters of the novel. After correcting proofs in the second half of the year, he prepared a special private edition of 50 copies to be sent to close friends for comment. And then on the 28th of May, 1945, the novel was officially published by Chapman and Hall. It was well received and soon became Book of the Month Club choice. It met with similar success in America, where War became a best-selling author for the first time, and he earned large sums of money from the book. 1946, discussions with MGM in Hollywood began for a film of the story, and a year later, War and his wife, Laura, sailed to America and spent a month in California. They're seen here with uh, Anna Mae Wong, the Chinese-American actress on the left, and in the center, diplomat and actor Sir Charles Mendel. But these negotiations came to nothing. Well, so much for the history of the novel. Although one should add that in 1959, War revised the book, altering the structure, rewriting some passages, and adding an explanatory preface. 
and this is the version that is generally in print today. Now, Waugh never offered a clue as to the model for Brideshead, and few, if any people, identified Brideshead as Castle Howard before it was dramatized on the screen. But in November 1944, Town and Country magazine in the USA published extracts of the novel with illustrations by the artist Konstantin Alajalov, who drew a house with a large central dome, terraces and a fountain, remarkably similar to Castle Howard. And standing in the foreground is Charles Ryder in uniform. Published editions generally avoided any representation of a building on the covers, but in 1957, Penguin Books did make an attempt, depicting a domed mansion beyond a barbed wire barrier. But how strongly, if at all, did Castle Howard feature in War's mind when he came to write his story? Today, this is a difficult question to answer because it's virtually impossible to perceive Brideshead as anything other than Castle Howard. So what once might have remained a minor point of curiosity for architectural aficionados and war enthusiasts suddenly became a debating point of the highest order through the realization of Brideshead as Castle Howard in both screen versions, first by Granada Television in 1981 and then by Miramax Films in 2008. These rendered the fictional Brideshead as unequivocally visual, specific, and above all, real, in the sense that the building, either in its genuine historical guise as home to the Howard family, or in its fictional one as home to the flights, could be visited. And it was War's biographer, Christopher Sykes, who in the 1970s first suggested that Castle Howard was the original for Brideshead. And the fictional home does bear a number of correspondences with Vambra's Baroque masterpiece in Yorkshire, most singularly the dome. However, the dome at Castle Howard is not quite like that at Brideshead, which is described in the book as false, designed to be seen from below like the cupolas at Chambord. Well, Castle Howard bears no resemblance to the magnificent 16th century chateau in the Loire Valley, nor is its drum merely an additional story full of segmental rooms, as is recorded in the book. But there are very few houses in England that are distinguished by a grand dome, especially from the Baroque period. The tall masonry lantern and large cupola, something more suited to a cathedral or a palace than a private home, are unique to Castle Howard. And War certainly visited Castle Howard at least once. His diary for the 4th of February 1937 records a stay at Ampleforth Abbey in Yorkshire during Holy Week, which included visiting Castle Howard. And if nothing else, it was the sheer size and dominance of the Castle Howard dome that lodged in his memory. But other things will have stuck in his mind from that first visit by car. Unlike so many visitors to the house, he would have approached from the north. Ampleforth lies 12 miles northwest of Castle Howard. Situated in the Howardian Hills, the Castle Howard estate is bisected by a north-south avenue running in a straight line for five miles. The undulating hills offer a series of glimpses of the house as it appears, disappears and reappears along this approach. At one point, the tree-lined avenue gives way to an open stretch of parkland with a small lodge on one side of the road and a large lake on the other that offers a spectacular vista up to the house perched at the top of a small incline and the skyline dominated by the great dome that crowns the building. This is the new and secret landscape that opens up to reveal the flight family seat to Charles Ryder. And the sequence of features he records correspond with the northern approach to Castle Howard. Avenue, 
lodges, wrought iron gates, parkland, a turn in the drive, a village green. Brideshead sits in a valley that might be likened to the troughs and dips that give the Howardian Hills their dramatic character. The screen of boskage in the novel might easily represent the plantings that surround Bamber's mansion, including Ray Wood to the east of the house, a site of ancient woodland. Equally, it should be said, these elements could form the approach to other country houses. They are, to some extent, generic features. But there's little doubt that War's journey by car to Castle Howard in 1937 came to underpin one of the most famous arrival scenes in literature. Early in the novel, Sebastian Flight drives Charles Ryder to his family home in a borrowed open two-seater Morris Cowley. The two men set off one morning from Oxford, they cross into the county of Berkshire, then at Swindon, they turn off the main road, stopping to eat strawberries and drink wine in a field. Resuming their journey, they drive for another hour before halting at an inn for further refreshment. And afterwards, they drive on and by early afternoon reach their destination, Brideshead. The meeting in the house with Nanny Hawkins is brief, Sebastian growing anxious to leave as soon as he learns that his family is returning. He refuses to stay for tea and reluctantly allows Charles a hurried glimpse of the chapel before they drive, before they depart, only just in time for they pass a chauffeur-driven Rolls-Royce coming down the drive. On this first visit to Sebastian's family home, there's little indication of its exact location, other than somewhere south and west of Oxford. Later in the novel, as Charles languishes in his father's gloomy London home during the summer vacation, he receives a letter from Sebastian. The letter paper is headed, Brideshead Castle, Wiltshire. And if the reader hadn't already deduced so from the original journey, here is confirmation of the location of Brideshead. And shortly afterwards, Charles receives the telegram summoning him to visit his injured friend. And he takes a train from Paddington Station, the famous gateway to the West Country. And on the journey, he has dinner in the restaurant after passing through Reading. And he then changes trains to a local line and in the twilight reaches Melstead Carberry, his destination. And after a short car journey with Julia Flight, he arrives for the second time at Brideshead. Well, transposing fictional journeys onto real geography can be a pointless exercise. And these journeys to Brideshead are difficult to gauge with any certainty and accuracy. After all, a fictional world is not beholden to precise miles and routes, exact names or true locations, nor even correct railway timetables. But it's clear Brideshead lies on the western side of Wiltshire, perhaps in the region of Corsham or possibly as far south as Warminster. And both towns boast famous large stately homes near them, Corsham Court and Longleat House. There is no Melstead Carberry in Wiltshire, but between Corsham and Warminster lies Melksham, which may or may not provide an acoustic clue as to the whereabouts of the fictional train station. Well, this literalism would no doubt invite an equally literal and dismissive response from war. And bearing in mind the author's caveat at the beginning of the book, I am not I, thou art not he or she, they are not they, one might also add the warning, it is not there. The transition between real and imagined places is a stock in trade for all novelists. Sooner or later, characters step out of an identifiable place into a wholly imaginary sphere. And yet, Brideshead as a place is undeniably real. So real that it's hard to think of many other English novels which feature a building, a named family home, so central to the narrative and exercising such a powerful influence 
on the thoughts and actions of characters. And the possible exceptions might be Manderley, the Cornish home of the De Winters in Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, published just six years before Brideshead, or E.M. Forster's Howard's End, published in 1910. So what sort of a stately pile is Brideshead? The fact often overlooked is that its full name is Brideshead Castle. And Sebastian's letter confirms this official title. But there is a sequence in chapter four when Brideshead's name and past is discussed. After reflecting on the pleasurable limbo of his summer days passed there, Charles asks Sebastian, why is this house called a castle? Sebastian's answer reveals that Brideshead Castle has been built from the stones of an older building, as indeed Castle Howard had. The topography is very definite. The new castle is in a valley a mile away from the earlier demolished structure, but the age of the house is less specific. Charles's first glimpse of Brideshead simply records an old house. Its Baroque character with domes, arches, broken pediments and coffered ceilings, features it has to be said not exclusive to the Baroque, would indicate a period broadly between the late 17th century and the first three decades of the 18th. However, in common with many country houses, Brideshead betrays activity from various eras. Parkland is the oldest feature, contemporary with the original castle, and probably medieval in origin. And the lakes, woods, and landscape date from the 18th or early 19th centuries, a century and a half ago, as Charles reminisces during his wartime return. Its architectural identity is also eclectic. The entrance lodges are described as classical, which could mean anything from the 17th century onwards. Perhaps small cubical structures such as the Buckingham Lodge at Stowe on the top left, or the little square lodges at Grimston Park in North Yorkshire on the right. The single lodge at Castle Howard in the bottom of the screen with its pitched roof doesn't fit this classical mould. Indoors, the library at Castle Howard is described as Sonesque, which means it could be contemporary with the architect Sir John Soane, active from the 1770s until the 1830s, and so it might look similar to the library at Soane's famous dwelling in Lincoln's Inn Fields on the left. Or perhaps it's closer in feel to the book room at Wimpole Hall in Cambridgeshire, which was altered for Soane for Lord Hardwick in the 1790s. The Chinese drawing room at Brideshead could date from the mid 18th century onwards, or perhaps a little earlier if the family had been in the vanguard of oriental taste. It might resemble the state bedroom on the top left at Nostril Priory in North Yorkshire, refashioned in the 1770s with Chinese wallpaper and green and gold lacquered Chippendale furniture. Or perhaps on the bottom right, the Chinese room at Burton Constable in East Yorkshire, with its riot of gilded grotesque creatures remodeled in the 1820s. The Pompeian or painted parlor in which Charles and Sebastian dine is adorned with medallions and rustic groups of figures. And this points to the decorative style popular after the excavations in Italy begun at the end of the 1730s and which became inextricably associated with the work of Robert Adam. And so, for example, on the left, we have the Etruscan dressing room at Osterley Park in Middlesex, dating from the 1770s. Or perhaps the parlour may be as perfect as the painted room at Spencer House in London on the right, decorated by James Stewart in the 1760s and reckoned to be the first proper neoclassical interior in England. And the tapestry hung hall is described as unchanged since the house was built, and so might resemble the great chamber at Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire with its famous hangings. 
or it may even approximate the tapestry drawing room at Castle Howard when covered with early 18th century hangings by, Sir, by, by John Vanderbank. Well, these brief hints as to the mix of architectural and decorative styles at Brideshead are tantalizing. For the reader, they might conjure a quick sense of period and perhaps a color scheme and arrangements of plasterwork, carving, textiles, and furniture. But these descriptions add texture and depth to the sense of place. And it's clear that War enjoys architectural richness every bit as much as he enjoys uh, gastronomic richness, since food is another focal point in the story. But two features of Brideshead date from much later. The chapel, a monument of Art Nouveau, was a wedding present from Lord Marchmain to his wife, dating from the last decade of the 19th century. The architect who built the chapel at Brideshead also altered the exterior of the house, adding a colonnade and flanking pavilions, one of which contains the chapel. And also outdoors is the frightful great fountain, so disliked by Ryder's wartime colleague Hooper. And this was brought to Brideshead from Italy in the early 19th century by one of Sebastian's ancestors. Now, War went to great length to describe the fountain in a memorandum he prepared for this MGM scriptwriter whilst in Hollywood. It was, he said, a combination of three famous works by Bernini at Rome. And these are on the right-hand side of the screen. They are the Trevi and Piazza Navona fountains and the elephant bearing the obelisk in the Piazza Minerva. And the Baroque flavor of the fountain is in keeping with the architectural style of Brideshead, but it is a later addition, a foreign importation. And Castle Howard's gigantic Atlas fountain on the left of the screen, it's also a latecomer, part of the Victorian improvements to the gardens. Well, it is only as Charles reflects on the architecture and decorative riches of Brideshead that we're given a clue as to its precise age was, he observes, designed 250 years before. This is in 1923, the year in which Charles is an undergraduate at Oxford. So that means that Brideshead would have been built around the 1670s, about 30 years before Castle Howard was built. So Brideshead is a later castle with an old name displaying a medley of styles and features. The level of detail War provides ensures that Brideshead is convincing as an edifice. The reader, reader can envisage a plausible, a plausible structure and surrounding landscape. And this is essential since the house plays a powerful role in terms of events, memories and associations in the narrative. The physical presence of the house underpins the relationships between characters and their relationship to the place. But this fictional house exercises a strong grasp on the reader's imagination as well. Now, strangely, this interest in the building is rather a recent issue. War's contemporaries were less concerned with the real model for Brideshead and much more interested in deciphering his characters. And one of the reasons War appended that caveat to the front of the book, I am not I, thou art not he or she, they are not they, was because inevitably it was read as a roman à clef, or a novel with a key. And because the story contains so many autobiographical elements, War's contemporaries made numerous identifications. People felt they recognized themselves or other figures in the characters. And this was impossible to avoid, and War indulged in a degree of literary hide and seek in some of his comments about the novel. Nowadays, Mr. Samgrass is recognized as a cruel parody of the Oxford Don Morris Barra, seen on the left here. Samgrass was played by John Grillo in the Granada production. Alas, in the movie version, he had a very fleeting appearance as little more than a clerical thug. 
Anthony Blanche was a composite figure based upon two of War's contemporaries at Oxford. Harold Acton, seen on the left, but also another man called Brian Howard, both self-proclaimed Eastheats. And here we see them played by Nicholas Grace in the Granada version and Joseph Beatty in the Miramax production. The shifty Rex Mottram was actually modelled on Brendan Bracken, who had supported War's furlough from the army, which had enabled him to write the novel. And again, this is played by Charles Keating in the centre in the Granada version and Jonathan Cake in the movie. And Sebastian's teddy bear is even said to have been inspired by John Betjeman's bear, Archie. He was a younger contemporary at Oxford. Well, these identifications have less resonance today with readers of the novel or viewers of the screen versions. And this wasn't the case with War's contemporaries, who knew many of the figures in question personally. But today, these individuals are all dead. They're bygone figures, culturally remote from a past and, in some eyes, discredited era. For most of us, these characters have a different life, as defined by the actors who played them on screen. But the deepest reservoir of influence that War drew from is the Ligon family of Madrasfield Court, Worcestershire, who informed his creation of the Flight family and their home. Resting on the edge of Great Malvern, Madrasfield has been home of the Ligons for a millennium, and War was first introduced to the family through Hugh Ligon, who he met at Oxford in the early 1920s. They were both members of the notorious Hypocrites Club, renowned for embracing jazz music, flamboyant dress, drunkenness, and camp behavior. They were thus the epitome of the Anglo-Catholics and Sodomites with unpleasant accents, who cousin Jasper warns Charles Ryder to steer clear of in his lecture on rules of conduct for new undergraduates. In this bohemian milieu, war was attracted to Hugh Ligon. And at the same time, he also fell in love with another undergraduate, Alistair Graham. And both men were models for the character of Sebastian Flight, as played by Anthony Andrews and Ben Whishaw. Now, Alistair Graham's home, Barford House in Warwickshire, was a 19th century stone building with a shallow dome just visible on the top. And war visited here regularly in the 1920s. It's been cited as a model for Brideshead. But the fact is, War visited many country houses. He was passionate about architecture, and as a novelist, was happy to let his literary imagination create an amalgam out of many places. Later in the 1930s, War visited Madrasfield regularly and came to know Hugh's sisters, Lettuce, Sybil, Mary, and Dorothy. Between 1931 and 36, the Ligon children lived at Madrasfield without their parents, following the scandal that had forced their father, the seventh Earl Beecham, into exile. Beecham fled England, having been accused of homosexuality by his brother-in-law, the Duke of Westminster. He spent the next five years roaming the globe. His wife, Lettice, had always been remote from her children, and following the scandal, elected to live away from Madrasfield with her youngest son, Dickie. And there was little reconciliation between the children and the mother by the time she died in 1936, the same year in which Hugh also died following an accident in Germany. Thus, in the Ligon family lie the seeds for the flights. Second son, who is both gay and alcoholic, a father living abroad, abroad in scandalous circumstances, and a strange wife who is not emotionally close to her children. And there are other parallels too. The eldest son, the pompous William Ligon, Viscount Elmley, who later became 8th Earl Beecham, seen here in the top left on the left of the picture with two of his sisters, Mary and Dorothy. Well, he married an older widow, and collected stamps and cigarette cards, and thus found a version of himself in the figure of Bridie, Lord Brideshead, who of course collects matchboxes in the novel. 
played by Simon Jones in the center and by Ed Stoppard on the right in the movie. War became close to the Ligon girls. Here on the top picture, we see uh, May Mamie and Coot, as they were called on the left-hand side of the picture, an unidentified woman in third from the left and War on the right. Well, he became close particularly to Mamie and Coot. And in a letter to uh, Dorothy, otherwise known as Coot, in 1944, he outlined his novel in progress. It's all about a family, he wrote whose father lives abroad, and a younger son. People will say he's like Huey, but you'll see he's not really Huey. And there's a house, as it might be Madrasfield, but it isn't really Madrasfield. For her own part in her memoir of war and her family, Dorothy Ligon felt that the resemblance between my family and the Marchmains has been much exaggerated. Yet in her reply to War's description of his novel, she, conclude, she conceded that Sebastian gives me such pangs. Fact and fiction. Where does one begin and the other end? The Ligons are not the flights, and yet elements of their family sit at the heart of War's novel, with varying degrees of likeness and artistic alteration. Some of the people are recognisable, notwithstanding War's protestations to the contrary, can other elements from real life be uncovered in his writing? War was impressed by the architecture of Madrasfield, which like so many country houses, bore traces of almost continuous alteration. In 1863, the Victorian architect, Philip Hardwick, had been commissioned by the family to alter the building, transforming a moated Elizabethan core into a vast asymmetrical red brick example of Victorian Gothic, with stepped gables, additional stories, a chapel, and a bell tower. Now, Madrasfield appears in one of War's earlier novels, A Handful of Dust, where it is called Hetton Abbey. But in Brideshead, it's most overtly present in the form of its Arts and Crafts Chapel, commissioned by the 7th Earl Beecham as a wedding gift to his wife in 1902. The chapel, which lies inside the house, is surprisingly small and compact, but beautifully decorated with panelling, frescoes, a grand gilded triptych and stained glass. In the novel, Charles and Sebastian enter the Brideshead Chapel not through the house, but by its public porch as they leave the building. The real and fictional chapels share a common provenance. Both are wedding presents from husband to wife, and they share an identical artistic pedigree as arts and crafts interiors. Here's the description from the novel. The whole interior had been gutted, elaborately refurnished and redecorated in the arts and crafts style of the last decade of the 19th century. Angels in printed cotton smocks, rambler roses, flower-spangled meadows, frisking lambs, texts in Celtic script, saints in armour, cover the walls in an intricate pattern of clear, bright colours. There was a triptych of pale oak, carved so as to give it the peculiar property of seeming to have been moulded in plasticine. Well, the decoration of the Madrasfield Chapel continued after 1902, as figures of each of the seven children of the Earl and Countess were added as they were born between 1904 and 1916. Thus, the chapel at Madrasfield is not only an affirmation of late Victorian Anglican faith in a contemporary style, it's also a private commemoration of a family in the eyes of God. By contrast, the chapel at Castle Howard, which features prominently in both screen versions, is a much larger space. It's redecorated in the 1870s when the Howards commissioned the firm of Morrison Co. to transform the area with painted frescoes by Charles E. McKemp and stained glass by Edward Byrne Jones. It too is an expression of high Anglicanism. Neither the Ligon family nor the Howards of Castle Howard are Catholic. And the chapel also depicts a similar assembly of motifs. 
angels in cotton smocks, rambler roses, flower spangled meadows, Celtic script, intricate patterns of clear bright colours and metal furniture. But the Castle Howard Chapel is a more eclectic interior, embracing pre-Raphaelite, aesthetic and arts and crafts styles. Now War never knew the Howards and their life in the 1930s bore little resemblance to that of the fictional Flight family or of their contemporaries, the Ligons. For one thing, the generations in each household were not the same age. The children of Lord Beecham were all born in the early years of the 20th century and matched the ages of the Flight children almost exactly. The children at Castle Howard were considerably younger. Geoffrey Howard, who had inherited Castle Howard after the deaths of his parents, the ninth Earl and Countess of Carlisle in 1911 and 1921 respectively, was married to Kitty Methuen, daughter of Field Marshal Paul Methuen of Caution Court. Liberal MP for many years, Geoffrey had been private parliamentary secretary to Prime Minister Herbert Asquith. And the couple had five children, Christian, Mark, George, Christopher, and Katie, born between 1916 and 1930. And here we see a picture in the second half of the 1920s with the four eldest children with their parents. But Kitty died in 1932 and Geoffrey three years later. Thus, by the mid 1930s, the children lived at Castle Howard under the guardianship of trustees. In that sense, they shared a parentless household in common with the Ligon children, who with their father in exile and their mother living away from home, spent their early twenties on their own at Madrasfield, the years when war used to come and stay. Nevertheless, at Madrasfield, just as at Brideshead, another parentless household, the children were surrounded by liveried servants. The Ligon family was enormously rich, and even during their father's absence, the children would observe the protocols of dressing for dinner and entertain quite lavishly. By contrast, the, this era was less glamorous at Castle Howard. After the deaths of their parents, the Howard children, by then in their late teens, do seem to have enjoyed some degree of entertaining, but perhaps not as lavish as at Madrasfield. Here are some very rare photographs of a country house party on the eve of the Second World War. Family group on the top left, on the right hand side, a rather splendid picture of uh, the late Duchess of Devonshire, on the right hand picture there, dressed in um, men's tails and a top hat. Um, below her is George Howard at the piano, another family group in the center, and then eldest of the Howard sons, Mark, are on horseback ready for a hunt. But there seem to have been few occasions for social gatherings of this in the late 30s at Castle Howard. And of course, all of this would end in September 1939. Well, the wartime history of Brideshead is one that causes heartache for Charles Ryder as he sees the house boarded up and empty of life and suffering at the hands of the army. Only Nanny Hawkins continues to inhabit the upper part of the house. Julia and Cordelia Flight overseas on war service and Bridie is with his regiment. Sebastian, of course, has long vanished in the story. The wartime history of Castle Howard was even more dramatic. The house was occupied not by the army but by a girls school. The three sons were all away on active service. Two of them, Mark and Christopher, were to die. Mark on the left in Normandy in 1944 Christopher on the right, who was in bomber command and was shot down over Germany in the same year. But early in the war, a cataclysmic event occurred that was to shape the future of Castle Howard for the rest of the 20th century. The disastrous blaze on the 9th of November 1940, when nearly 20 rooms and the dome were destroyed and numerous treasures inside the house. Mercifully, nobody was killed in the fire, but the devastation was enormous. Room after room remained a charred shell, and the entire southeast wing and much of the central block was left open to the skies. Also lost in the blaze 
were the 18th century painted interiors by Antonio Pellegrini in the garden hall and high saloon. By the end of the war, Castle Howard existed as a part ruin, although the one surviving son, George Howard, on his return from service, determined to keep the family home and set about restoring it. Further afield, also by the end of the war, another building had taken root in people's imagination through the pages of Brideshead Revisited. And that might be the end of matters. These two buildings existing in separate or parallel worlds, unconnected in most people's minds. But all this was to change at the end of the 1970s, when Gran Granada Television chose Castle Howard as Brideshead. In the prospectus, producer Derek Granger was insistent that a particularly fine architectural example of English domestic Baroque be chosen for the location. And after scouting various possibilities, he declared Castle Howard quite the most romantic and atmospheric house I have ever seen. It most beautifully fills the bill. In 1978, George Howard, seen on the bottom of the screen here in conversation with Laurence Olivier, Howard enthusiastically welcomed Granada's proposal to use his home. And he lent many items in the house as props and advised the designers with his historical knowledge. And shrewdly, he recognized that the series would result in worldwide fame for Castle Howard. And the rest, as they say, is history. In choosing to build a set in the shell of the garden hall where Charles Ryder paints his murals, the enterprise was in a strange way reenacting history. The lost decoration was replaced by Ryder's painted scenes. And in turn, these, after the filming, would be, would be replaced by new murals, fantasy views of imaginary Vambra buildings commissioned by George Howard from the New Zealand artist Felix Kelly. And so today, the Garden Hall has a new identity as a late 20th century interior, fashioned out of the rooms of an earlier space, but in keeping, but in keeping with the mood and ethos of Castle Howard. But little did anyone imagine back in 1981, following the enormous success of the television series, that a quarter of a century later, another production team would arrive at Castle Howard and follow exactly the same pattern in the room directly above the garden hall. The Pellegrini frescoes in the high saloon, visible on the left, had perished in the fire of 1940. And after years of lying limp empty as a storage area, this suite of rooms known as the High South was chosen by Miramax Films for a spectacular set to represent the painted parlor inside Brideshead. So by a strange coincidence, this room has also been revived as a painted chamber, albeit very different in style and subject from its original 18th century Venetian decoration. The murals depict religious subjects appropriate for the Catholicism of the Marchmain family, but of course very far removed from the Pompeian style of the parlor in the novel. But why did the producers choose to make the same film in the same location? It was an enormous challenge. The Granada production still cast a very long shadow, 27 years after it was first broadcast. Now the new movie had been in development for two years prior to filming in 2008, raising finance and scouting for an appropriate location. Chatsworth was considered but nothing came of this. Burley House in Lincolnshire was a very strong contender, especially on account of its famous painted staircase with the dram dramatic murals of the heaven and hell room. In the end, Castle Howard was chosen. The director, Julian Gerald, and producer, Kevin Lodner, likened the atmosphere of Castle Howard, liked, liked the atmosphere of Castle Howard. They believed it had a theatrical feel, which is hardly surprising since Vambra had been a successful playwright before turning to architecture. And they felt the house could once more be adapted, turned into a Catholic household. 
And the team also made a conscious decision not to reimmerse themselves in the Granada series. And they felt they were also helped by the fact that the three, three principal young stars had really only just been born around 1981. They were, in a sense, completely innocent of the Granada version. But at the same time, the producers realized that they would have to sh share or compete with certain iconic scenes in the story. Most notably, the first arrival at the house and the dramatic climax in the building. So for example, in the Granada production, all the coming and going take place, takes place on the north side of Castle Howard. In the movie, this action is switched to the south side of the building to avoid any sense of deja vu. And for both productions, various interiors in the house were temporarily modified as rooms inside Brideshead. The Great Hall was always the locus for arrivals and meetings. And in the Granada version on the top left, it was transformed into military quarters for the wartime episodes. The Long Gallery. In the Granada version, it acted as a cavernous drawing room in which Jeremy Irons often spends time reflecting. But in the Miramax version, it became the ballroom for Julia's party. The Grand Staircase. In the Granada version, here Jeremy Irons and Diana Quick reflect on a future without one another towards the end of the novel. But in the movie version, it is the entrance to the house when Ben Wishaw brings Matthew Good to Brideshead for the first time. And in the background, a very large artificial painting was hung depicting the crucifixion. The lake sitting room in the east wing of the house was Lady Marchmain's private study in the Granada version. And it was here that Jeremy Irons and Claire Bloom played out a series of tense interviews. Outdoors, the Temple of the Four Winds was the setting for the inebriated frivolity of the wine tasting episode in both productions, indoors for Granada and outdoors for the movie. And then nude sunbathing on the roof in the Granada series gave way to skinny dipping in the chilly waters of the Atlas Fountain for Matthew Good and Ben, Winch ben Wishaw in the movie. And in the Granada version, the Archbishop's room doubled as the Queen's room in the story, the room where Lord Marchmain chooses to spend his final days. And so it becomes his bedroom, as well as his study, as where places where the rest of the family take dinner in the evening. And of course, it's the place where his famous death scene takes place, seen here on the left. Whereas for the movie version, that was transferred to the painted parlor, for Michael Gambon. And of course, you can't talk about Brideshead without talking about teddy bears. Both of these bears were set to make a reappearance at Castle Howard at the Brideshead Festival this June, which alas, has had to be postponed. What really appealed though to the Miramax producers was the opportunity to work with a blank slate to create something new in the burnt out parts of the High South. So the painted parlor was used for key moments. Notably, the dinner when Charles first meets Lady Marchmain, and for the deathbed scene at the end of the novel, with a huge stage bed uh, constructed to be put in the middle of the room. But also because this is a first floor space, it had offered additional possibilities with dramatic views beyond the room itself, into the depths of the Great Hall, which sits beneath the dome in the heart of the building. So here is Hayley Atwell, backlit by three huge arc lights mounted on cherry pickers to the north of the house. And this first floor set also overlooks the gardens on the south side and the Atlas Fountain, which is an important focal point in the film especially when Sebastian looks down anxiously from on high as his mother takes his new friend for a walk around the gardens after dinner. So this 
second filming of the story here is a strange example of history repeating itself. Conversations held with the production team in late 2007 echoed exactly the conversations between Castle Howard and Granada Television back at the end of the 1970s. Two films of the same story in the same house, restoring two rooms, one directly above the other, each with artificially painted interiors, which just happen to replace original painted interiors lost in the fire. For those who witnessed both productions, this has not been Brideshead revisited so much as Brideshead Deja Vu. An unexpected legacy of the terrible fire of 1940 was how it resulted many decades later in these two instances of the house being spectacularly transformed. And Castle Howard continues to live a curious dual existence in the public imagination as both the historic home of the Howard family and the fictional home of the Flight family. As we know, War located his original house in the novel in Wiltshire, and he drew on a number of things from his own life to inform this famous fictional building and family. And Castle Howard was part of that creative chemistry, specifically the dome and the Baroque architecture of the house. But War supplied other playful hints in the novel too. Among the high society Charles Ryder hears about whilst in Venice is a Lord Moulton, the name of the nearest town to Castle Howard. And there are references to Ampleforth Abbey in the story. And the stuffy people who boycott Julia's wedding include the Vambra family. This must have been War's teasing homage to Castle Howard's architect, who he once praised as an inspired amateur. So nowadays, Brideshead has a specific local identity. The Wiltshire of the book has shifted irrevocably to Yorkshire, and the house has become permanently identified with Castle Howard. And of course, many people can genuinely visit Brideshead today. Thousands turn off the main road and a few minutes later, they have arrived. And numerous comments in the house visitor book confirm this interplay of an imaginary destination with a real one. Top comment comes from a visitor from Australia. The bottom comment from a visitor from the Netherlands. These are not uncommon, these associations between fact and fiction. Well, I've talked about three Brideshead's, the novel, TV, and the movie versions. And you might choose to visit any one of these. Or you could elect to travel to Madrasfield in, York, in Worcestershire, which is open a few days a year. But actually, there are four Brideshead's. So instead, you might choose to copy War's 1937 journey along country roads through the Howardian Hills where the undulating road provides tantalizing glimpses of a magical building. There are parallels and differences between Castle Howard and Brideshead, but ultimately Castle Howard, whether it's perceived as Brideshead or whether it's experienced as Castle Howard itself, always manages to look visually stunning and it remains a magnificent place to visit, rich in real history as well as in fictional association. So as you approach the house, you may perhaps ask yourself, is it Castle Howard or is it Brideshead that you're visiting? Well, that is for you to decide. Well, thank you very much. Um, that finishes uh, my talk. And uh, with Matt's help, um, I'm very happy to answer some questions. I think we've got a, a short period. Am I right, Matt, in which to take some questions? Yeah, that's right. So we've, um, because of how many people are in the room today, um, we are going to limit um, the time that we'll take questions to, I think, 15 minutes um, tops. Just to kind of quickly introduce you to how we will do that, um, if you all hover down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a panel, um, and one of those panels says chat. Now, if you click on that button, it'll bring up a box where you can type questions, which will then send them to myself, and I will then put the questions to Chris. So... Um, just while, if anyone does have any questions, you are typing away in there. Um, just a couple of things from me. Um, obviously, thank you very much to everyone for attending this session.
we've had a, a really, really wonderful response. And I think we're broadcasting in up to 12 countries now, Chris. So you have gone global. <laughs> um, obviously, this kind of replaced um, the Brideshead Festival, which was meant to take place in June of this year. Unfortunately, that's had to be postponed. We do hope that we will be able to run more Brideshead events um, across the summer. So it will be a watch this space um, message for now and we do obviously have everyone's email address who took part in the session today so we will let you know about any future events that take place too just while we're on the topic of the brideshead festival and um, one of our partners for that event was due to be slow motion who are a local gin distillery and um, if you joined the room a little bit early at the beginning of the session you you will have seen an advert for um, a special brideshead cocktail that Slow Motion made for us especially. Um, I will send out the recipe for that cocktail, which I believe is called a March Main Martinez. Um, and there is a discount code on there for you to use as well. Um, so Chris, I think we did have a question that was sent in advance um, from yeah. one of the visitors today. So do you just want to read out what the question was and then um, a response as well? I haven't got it in front of me, Matt, but if I remember correctly, it was it was asking um, actually what evidence is there that the war went inside the house, met the family and so on. Uh, and it's it's a bit thin on that score. Um, the had to bear in mind the date war visits Castle Howard in 1937. This means that Jeffrey and Kitty Howard have, have both been dead a few years. So the teenage children are living at Castle Howard with their trustees. Um, it's very unlikely they would have invited War, who would have been a good 10 years older than them. Um, whether he came inside, it's difficult to say because it's February, so Castle Howard would not naturally have been open then, and Castle Howard wasn't open to the public in the 1930s in the way that we understand it in, say, the spring and summer and autumn months today. Um, and I have also looked in the um, visitors book and there is alas no signature that says e war in it um, but the fact that the war makes mention of it in his diary and I think there are so many clues and hints um, suggest to me that not only was he familiar with the outside of the building but probably like any good uh, novelist and a novelist who is interested in history and architecture he'd done a lot of homework if you like on the history of Castle Howard the Howard family and the fact that he could weave in these kind of little playful hints about a Vanbrugh family and the nearby town becoming Lord Moulton. I think that he was very familiar with the building. But I can't point a smoking gun, as it were, to say he stepped in through the front door here on that particular day. Brilliant. I think the second part of that question was if, um, if War had been travelling from Ampleforth, from the north, what yeah. would he have arrived in if not in a motor car? Um, I can't imagine Evelyn Waugh taking a bus, um, <laughs> conceivably a taxi, undoubtedly uh, a motor car of some sort. Brilliant. So we'll move on to a couple of the questions that have come in um, since, um, since we finished. So the first one is, Chris, do you personally feel like you're stepping into the novel when you're inside Castle Howard? Um, the answer to that is some days I do and, and some days I don't, um, because as I, I said at the end of my talk, I mean, Castle Howard is fabulously rich in real history. I mean, there's 300 years of uh, endless narratives um, and, and kind of historical significance. Uh, and that tends to, as it were, pri take priority in my mind. But of course, there are moments when you might walk through the building and you, and you can, in your mind, you can conjure up little scenes from either production on the, on the screen that remind you of how the building was used and people, as it were, moved through the interiors. And I guess on from that then, the, the second question that we've had kind of relates to that is that, did you enjoy the book? Um, and then what did you study to become a curator today? Well, two, two different questions. Well, first of all, um, the first time I read the book, was many, many moons ago when I was a school teacher and had to teach it to children. Um, and not surprisingly, I didn't really get a lot out of the book. Um, when I came to reread it, having left school teaching behind to come and work in the fabulous Castle Howard, of course it, it meant something more. And each time I've gone back and, and reread the novel and quite often read it in association with looking at the productions on the screen, um, 
I get more and more out of it. I think it's a wonderfully crafted novel. Um, and I do think that the, uh, quite apart from the plot and the kind of the big issues of, of faith and love and loss and things like that, I think uh, the, the craftsmanship is terrific and the details that are weaved together in terms of description of architecture and decoration, but things like food uh, and landscape too. Um, so I do enjoy it very much actually. Um, how did I become a curator? I happened to fall into the job many years ago uh, when I went round Castle Howard as a visitor um, and happened to notice that um, some of the books on the shelves in the rooms on uh, view to the public, the books didn't seem in a lot of order and the, the then guides um, couldn't tell me much about the, the history of the library there. So I um, wrote to the family and said, love the visit to the house, very interesting library. Um, looks as though uh, it could do with a bit of sorting out. I don't suppose you'd like somebody to come and do that. And that was um, 35 years ago. So uh, um, one of those great chance moments. And you've been learning ever since. Never stop. Never stop. <laughs>